Okay. Thanks, Maria. Just uh, let me know if anything you can't hear too well or any problems. Um, okay, yeah, so I'm based in uh, Nanaimo, British Columbia, on the west coast of Canada. And I'm actually in Bill Ricker's old office, you know, the Ricker curve or the Ricker model. I think I'm, I have his old office here. So a um, bit of history there. Uh, okay, so um, an outline of the talk, I'm gonna give a bit of background on size spectra. I know most of you would know what they are, but let's get everyone on the, on the same page. Um, give some brief results from two methods papers that we had. Uh, they've been out a few years, so I'm not going to delve into the full details of them because people have used them and maybe read them already. And also get into some issues that can arise when fitting real data. And then some work I've been doing this year on um, whether size spectral approaches can help with estimating fish recruitment. And that's linked into the Hake assessment work that I do. And finally, the size spectral package that I wrote. Um, we've got some new plotting ideas that have been there and future plans for the for the package. So these are two um, papers. I just want to acknowledge my co-authors on these. So I'm trying to minimize the thing at the top. And I, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so I did these two papers. Um, so yeah, 2017 and 2020 now. So James Robinson, who was a PhD student down at University of Victoria, with Julia Baum, who's down there as well. Uh, Michael Plank is a mathematician in New Zealand, and Judah Blanchard is an ecologist based in Tasmania. Okay, and also the size spectra R package. So it's uh, freely available on GitHub. Um, there's the address. You can just Google size spectra as one word, and it should come up. And it uses, the main thing it does is usually is the likelihood methods that we developed in the papers. So, okay, first of all, so what is the size spectrum? So basically it characterizes how property of community varies with body size. So in a general term, um, you'd have body size on the x-axis um, on a logarithmic scale and abundance on the y-axis. And the general idea is that you have lots and lots of small organisms. Uh, so lots of individual phytoplankton, zooplankton. You have some kind of invertebrates, and then you have some small fish, and then fewer large fish. So it's kind of this um, um, diagram like this I got from Jonathan Room down in um, the United States. And the general idea, this is kind of just hand wavy for now, is that the general slope of these sort of plots is some kind of ecosystem indicator. And people like using these because the idea is that if you have fishing at the higher trophic level, um, that decreases the abundance of the large fish. And if that releases some uh, predation pressure on the smaller organisms, that can increase their abundance. So the whole slope would kind of shift. And that gives you some kind of indication of um, fishing pressure. And uh, I work in the marine, marine world. So I think all the examples I have are probably more uh, marine focus, but these ideas can apply to terrestrial work as well. So in the past, these uh, so size spectra have been used as ecosystem indicators for many marine systems, uh, many communities. Uh, for example, groundfish in the Bering Sea, as well as the North Sea and the Celtic Sea. Uh, kelp forests, looking at rockfish populations um, here in British Columbia. And coral reefs, it's quite popular to look at coral reefs. So the South Pacific, the Bahamas and Fiji, as well as um, macrophyte communities in freshwater ponds in Uruguay, chlorophyll um, satellite data from the North Atlantic Ocean and macro invertebrates in the uh, North Sea as well. That's just a few of the examples um, that historically have used size spectra. So looking at these different examples and others, we realized that researchers have used eight different methods to actually calculate this slope of the size spectra, the steepening and shallowing that I mentioned earlier. So eight different methods, and does that matter? Uh, is that important, these different methods? Um, just a bit more history, the bunch of the early work was actually done. So I work for Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the Canadian government department. And some of these early papers were done actually here in the building I'm at, here in Nanaimo in BC. 
so Sheldon and Parsons back in 67, and then Jake Rice was here in 1996, I think. Yeah. And then on the east coast of Canada, I guess Sheldon moved over there. And in 1972, had a paper, and they also had a paper talking about the population density of Loch Ness monsters, so that mythical mythical monster up in uh, Scotland. Um, a little kind of one-page kind of amusing article. And also uh, Trevor Platt and Ken Denman. Um, Trevor Platt's person that got me to first come to Canada from England. And I worked with him on the East Coast, but not on size spectra at all. And Ken Denman was based here down in, um, also on Vancouver Island, down in Victoria. So we've had a kind of good history of this work, but nobody really uses it too much right now, I don't think, within um, our department. So getting back to the methods, we're going to, so the idea of the first paper was to test methods um, using simulated data. So we're going to simulate some data and test the different methods. But first of all, you've got to clarify what you want to do. How are you going to simulate the data? So first of all, we need to clarify the definition. And so looking back at this figure, this schematic, what does it really mean? So kind of forgetting about the log axes for now, if it's just abundance, uh, you have lots of small animals, organisms, and a few large ones. What does that really mean? It's really a kind of, it's like a distribution. It could be a normal distribution, would have a nice hump. In this case, it's a decaying distribution. And Ethan White had a nice paper and kind of explaining how this kind of abundant size spectrum is really a probability density function of body sizes. So they called it the individual size distribution, and that's terminology that we've been using as well. Um, example of how people would fit these, they would typically plot, um, you'd have um, you'd have size on the x-axis, you'd have counts of all, number of organisms in each bin. You'd have these size bins, and you would count the number of uh, organisms in each bin and plot them, so the points here, and fit a regression to give the uh, to give a slope. And um, that's one example that people would do. And because people are fitting these straight lines on log-log plots, and that means that they're really kind of assuming a power law relationship, which is what was recommended actually quite a while ago by Vidondo et al. in 1997. So just briefly, if the log of abundance, if you plot it against the log of the size, and you have a straight line, and your body size is x, and the slope of this is capital B, the log of the abundance is just a kind of straight line equation. You do a bit of algebra, you end up with abundance being x to the power b. So that's what is the definition of a power law. So with exponent capital B. So that's just why the straight lines on log-log plots turn into power laws. And the previous, the individual size distribution idea is why we want to look at distributions. So the natural idea is to look at a power law distribution. Also, studies are usually restricted to a specific community. So the, the nice conceptual idea is the whole food web could be done, you know, everything up from phytoplankton up to up to whales. But in practice, you're looking at data from, say, some fishing tool surveys, and they're catching fish between certain body sizes. They're not going to catch the really small stuff, and then the big stuff is going to just avoid the nets. So you have a restricted range. Unfortunately, this means you can't technically really extrapolate to really big animals, like a lot less monster, if you haven't seen one that big, because we're saying you're kind of restricting yourself to the, the maximum size that you've seen. But unfortunately, it kind of rules that out theoretically, but um, you could, you could if you want to. And just to emphasize, even that previous figure had lots of different organisms, the data are just individual body sizes, regardless of species. You don't care which species, which organism comes from. So even though a small fish might eat a shrimp and the bigger fish eats a small fish, we don't really keep track of the different species. We just worry about the body size of every individual that we that we measure. So in the kind of in the fisheries ecology world, I kind of think of these size spectra as kind of intermediate complexity type models. So at the one end you have these complex food web models that try to model everything. And at the other end, we have single species stock assessments that are still complicated, but we just focus on one species. So size spectra are kind of somewhere in the, in, in between uh, in the sense of ecological complexity. So I mentioned this uh, power law distribution we want to fit. So the idea is that we use a bounded power law distribution. We're bounding it between um, 
defined values. And basically, this is the equation. The power of the density function is just um, C times X to the power of B. C is just a normalization constant. And X has to be between the X min and the X max values. Uh, these are quite important. These are going to come up later in the fitting ideas. So as I said, we do this bounded, ba bounded distribution because real body masses are bounded. And also the data collection often samples a specific range, which can depend on, say, net size, whatever. You might not catch the smaller organisms, smaller than X min, or the ones bigger than X max. So what we did in the first paper was to basically simulate data and then fit the data using eight different methods and see if you can um, if you can get the value of B, the exponent that we're interested in, you can extract that again, if you can estimate that well, given we know the value. So what we do, we first of all generated a thousand body masses from this distribution, and we had to set the parameters. So we put B as minus two, X min at one, and X max at a thousand. So generate a thousand animals and you get like lots of small ones and you're a big one. So, as I said, as I said, B is the size spectrum exponent, which is can be related to the slope in the other methods, and that's what we're interested in. And the more negative B, uh, the more negative the B is, it's a steepening slope. So, under fishing, you might expect a more negative value of B. Um, so one thing I'll get to the kind of log log plots in a bit. If you just plot this distribution, f of x um, with B is minus two, going from one to a thousand. This is just a normalization constant, how it drops out. If you plot it just on normal axes, you get this very kind of steep distribution and this very long tail. This idea is characteristic of power laws in general. And you can't really see much going on here. Everything's weighted down to the left-hand side. And even if, you, if, even if you simulate data and then plot a histogram, typically, I think the default in R programming language is to give you eight, eight bins. So the first one is from zero to 50, and almost all the values from a simulation fall into that first bin. So you can't really see much in that left-hand figure. You can kind of do this thing where you um, break the y-axis. So it's kind of accurate, but it's not very, it's a bit misleading. It's not very um, intuitive to see to see that. So I think this is, I think this is why generally log, log axes have been used in the past to put the data because you have lots and lots of small values and not many big ones. And most methods, most methods in the past would then fit a regression plot to such, to such plots. And even if you increase that same data, that's a bin width of 50. Even if you do a bin width of 10 or bin width of five, you're going from one to a thousand and you only get, you still get most of the values, you know, over 80% fall in that first bin going from one to five. It's very, very skewed, these distributions. And you can see this long tail, it kind of shows up here. You've got a few values and one value that's about, about 400. So this is what we did in the first um, paper. Um, the take home message is that we recommended the likelihood method, which I'll get to in a second. And yeah, I don't go through all the results. The paper's been around a while. And um, so basically what we did, we tested different methods. So here's two of the methods at the top where people kind of bin the data and look at the biomass in each bin. Uh, on the right hand side, they normalized it. So you're plotting these things in various ways and fitting regressions and getting estimates of B. The one on the bottom left is called a bank frequency plot and people just fit a straight line to that. And the bottom right is the likelihood method that I'll get to. And we, um, I like to plot it in this way. It shows kind of all the data. So there's a thousand values. These plots are a little bit unintuitive at first. So the x-axis has the values going from one to the maximum value, so 400 again. And the y-axis is the number of values that are bigger than or equal to each value on the x-axis. So every point is a different individual. <clears throat> so the first one, the smallest one, would be a, a body mass of kind of 1.01 grams or something. And then you plot that first. And then because that's the smallest, all the values in the data set are bigger than that. So there's a thousand values here in our simulation. So you have a thousand values here. And as you move up to the right, you have less values bigger than each value. So 999, 998, and so, so on. And because it's a power law and the, we have these log axes, the log log axes, you get a straight line 
in this part of, of the curve. Of the this is the fitted distribution. Sorry, the red line is the fitted distribution using likelihood, and you get this fairly straight line at the top here, and it curves away at the bottom. <clears throat> so briefly, the likelihood method doesn't uh, require plotting the data at all. That was just showing it. It's basically you have individual measurements. Say you have a thousand of these values. All you have is this like log likelihood function that we've worked out. And basically, it's the likelihood of the value of B, different values of B, given all the data. Turns out to be this function here. Don't worry about the details, but the point is that we we find the value of B that maximizes this function. And so it's max, it's finding the B that is most likely given the data that we've observed, observed, observed. So we did that, and we did that 10,000 times to generate 10,000 different data sets and have these kind of histograms of the values of B. And the true value is minus two because we fixed it in the simulations. And this is these are histograms of different methods that I just mentioned briefly, and how well they they kind of fit the um, how well they estimate the value of minus two. You see, the likelihood one is kind of the narrowest out of these, but the others are pretty good as well, fairly symmetric, a bit noisier around the true value. They seem okay. The means and medians are quite close to minus two, and the likelihood method has the narrowest distribution. But when we did sensitivity test by trying B equals minus 1.5, minus 2.5, different values, the likelihood method was the only one that was consistently accurate in these sort of plots. I think they're in the supplementary information of the first of the first paper. Now also back in 2000, Jake Rice wrote that um, people hadn't really considered un uncertainty of these slopes when they worked them out and only occasionally done that. So found that particularly unsettling in biology, we like to have uncertainty around estimates. So with the seven regression-based estimates, I didn't mention them all, we can calculate confidence intervals with the slope and then adjust that to give you your estimate for B. And for the likelihood method, we use the profile likelihood ratio test, which is fairly standard. So when we calculate confidence intervals, by definition, <clears throat> we want 95% of the 95% confidence intervals to contain the true value of B. That's kind of the definition of a confidence interval. So when we do that and we simulate um, 10,000 data sets, we end up with 10,000 intervals. So here I'm showing just 300 of them. And each horizontal line is the confidence interval for a simulated data set for this method here. Um, the x-axis is the estimate of B. So minus two again is the true value from the simulations. And each horizontal line is a confidence interval from a simulation and it's colored in gray if it does overlap minus two and it's blue if it doesn't overlap minus two so the blue ones are bad because they're kind of not capturing the true value the gray ones are good <clears throat> and this number here is the observed coverage which should be 95 percent. so 90 percent isn't too bad but ideally you want 95 percent of your 95 percent confidence intervals to include the true value so we did that for various methods we got these two methods both had 90 percent coverage the LCD one, which is, I know I didn't mention it in detail when you do the rank frequency plot and just fit a straight line, it gives you very narrow confidence intervals. These are all plotted as, like in the other figures, but the only ones in the middle here are the only ones that cover minus two. So this is quite a good lesson that narrow confidence intervals aren't necessarily good because they're, if they're not capturing the true value, then they're not very good at all. So only 6% of, of these intervals are capturing the true value. And then for likelihood, we found we've got this nice symmetric kind of pattern. The gray ones are the ones that include the true value from the simulation. And then it turns out that 95% of them are gray, including the true value, and only 5% do not include it, which is what we what we want. So we found that likelihood, uh, maximum likelihood estimation was the only method that would yield these reliable confidence intervals. So now I'm gonna move on to Binge data. This is kind of the focus of the second paper. Um, so some data. So especially older data. If you're on a boat and it's kind of rocking, they were just I think actually just throw, just kind of measure. Um, you know, have a measuring board and you kind of roughly get how long the fish is. It's divided into into bins. It's hard to measure. It's hard to weigh fish on a boat, and it's okay now. But I think years ago it was much harder. So. Um, so, for example, you might have these 
for measuring fish lengths. And all the data you have might only be available in bin form. So phytoplankton data, they would use these quarter counters to count particles, <coughs> but that comes to you in a bin in a bin form. So just get your head around the idea of bin data. So just an illustration, I'm showing five centimeter bins so you can see them. So this individual fish, this flat fish, is you know it's about 34 centimeters long. So if you measured it and you were binning the data, you would it would be between 30 and 35. It would be in this bin, this 30 to 35 centimeter bin. But really that bin contains fish anywhere from 30 centimeters to 35 centimeters. So even, um, quite funny, even like getting the same figure, a photo and blowing it up, it does look, that top figure, uh, top fish does look a lot, lot bigger than the, the bottom fish in terms of body mass. So there's, when you have a value, you say there's one fish in this bin, it really could be anywhere in this whole range. And as I mentioned, other types of data are often only available <clears throat> from, um, uh, in a bin form. So I think that's also why partly why researchers would fit regressions to counts in the bins, like this approach I mentioned earlier. And also years ago, people, you know, computing power was much less than it is now. So you could fit regressions to data fairly easily um, rather than the more fancy likelihood methods that require a bit more computing power. So in the second paper, we extended the likelihood approach to this MLE bin approach where we tested it in the second paper to more formally deal with bin data. And again, we did some simulations and it found it to be unbiased when estimating the value of B. And again, you did reliable confidence intervals. Um, so we recommend that, that method. Uh, it also can be used to digitize historical plots and reanalyze the data. So you could actually go back and if you have this figure from some paper, you could um, digitize this. This will give you the counts and the body size, you'd have to work out the bin breaks, which isn't always that easy in these sort of plots, but there's a way of doing it. I think I've done it in the past before. So you could reanalyze um, previous you know, historical data with our methods. So just briefly, the idea behind the MLE bin method, I mean, what is bin data? Really, you have these bins like we had before. Uh, you just number the bins, one, two, three, let's call it J. There's counts in each bin. So there's uh, how many how many animals are in each bin or organisms. And you also need the bin breaks. So the W1, W2, the breaks between the bins. <clears throat> These can be equally spaced. They don't have to be. They can be any size you want. The method still uh, will work. And again, the idea, we have this likelihood function. Don't worry about the details, but you have this kind of function here that again contains values of B and contains all the data and the sample size. And again, we want to find the value of B to maximize this function. It's the likelihood. So it's maximizing the likelihood of each value. Uh, you find the most likely value of B given the data that you have, which is similar to what we had before for the MLE method, the first one, where you just you have a likelihood function again, a bit simpler, but you again have to maximize it to get your value of B. The one thing with these functions, they have this x min and x max in them, the minimum assumed body size and the maximum. And <coughs> because we have explicitly defined that the bounded power law function early on, we actually need values for x min and x max. Um, so they're, man they're the minimum and maximum values of body mass that we're considering. And the past, the fitting methods in the past, they kind of didn't really have to worry about them. You just kind of fit the regression to the, to the plots and it didn't really have to specify the actual values. But we actually need to put them into that likelihood function that we want to maximize. So mathematically, the, the maximum, the most likely value of x min is just the minimum value of the data. Um, and the maximum and the like most likely value for x max is the maximum value of the data. There's a bit, bit of math that can show that, but it's kind of somewhat intuitive. If your biggest fish is 400 grams, um, saying the biggest fish could be 500 grams is less likely than saying the biggest fish could be 400 grams and kind of similar for the X min. Um, but however, that's kind of the theoretical uh, aspect, but the empirical data you might, you might get and try and analyze is certainly not as clean as simulated data would be. Um, so, I mean, admittedly those first two papers were mostly simulated data 
we did look at some North Fish sea data, which required some novel ideas. But um, yeah, I've been looking at other data more recently, and you do have to think about how to determine X min and X max. So there's a couple of options. Um, ideally, you would X min would be determined by the data collection. So um, if you're confident you're catching all the organisms organisms bigger than two grams, you can get rid of the ones smaller than two grams and just set your X min to be two grams. So looking at everything bigger than that value of two. So in fishing, again, it might be a net that catches a certain size, anything else just passes through. Or I guess some other examples you could, you know, if you're not seeing certain size animals, you just wouldn't expect to count them. The trouble is you often catch some small ones. So even a net that's designed to catch a certain size, it's going to catch a few of the small organisms. If you're trying to fit them into your fit, try and include them into your fit, it's going to mess things up a bit. So ideally, you'd have some kind of a priori information before you even look at the data of what you expect the X min to be. Another way is to, <clears throat> I think it's good to plot the data in different ways, like histograms, log log plots, different things, just to um, basically make sure that the, the smallest organisms are the most numerous. So remember this power law distribution assumes that the lowest body sizes are the most abundant. And the, the earlier other methods also assume this as well. So one way of doing this is plotting a kind of histogram of, of the values and um, uh, looking at the mode of it, which I'll show later in, in an example. Now for Xmax, um, again, it will ideally be determined by the data collection. So if you expect the biggest organism you're going to see is 10 kilograms, then you can set your Xmax to be 10 kilograms. For some reason, you're not catching the bigger, the bigger ones. And again, it's pretty good to plot the data in different ways. And um, it's a bit tricky. There's an example coming up as well. So remember that this power law distribution assumes that the highest body sizes are the least numerous, but also are very, very rare. So if you you have some data, but you have one that's kind of a lot bigger, it's kind of an outlier, but it's also kind of partly expected with these power law distributions. So it's a little bit subtle how you deal with them. Um, and if you have, say, you have multiple years of data, <clears throat> you can either set X max separately for each year. So you could say, um, yeah, just the value you see in that year. Or you can set to a single kind of global value at the maximum you observe across all years. So if you're saying, you know, if one year we, in 1995, we caught a 1,000 gram fish, then we expect to be able to see that kind of value. So let's set our X max to be that big value for all the years. So the latter, that latter choice kind of accounts for knowing that, that animals are that big exist in a community, but you don't see them every year. Again, because they're rare, the rare large ones, you're not going to catch every year. So it's a bit tricky. Um, OK, now I'm going to move on to <clears throat> some ideas, um, some current work I've been doing this year, looking at um, to help with uh, fisheries stock assessments. So Maria mentioned I work on uh, one of my jobs here is working on the Pacific Hake uh, stock assessment. There's a treaty between the US and Canada. The Pacific Hake is the most abundant ground fish population in the California current ecosystem <laughs> off the west coast of Canada and the US. They generally spawn down off California and migrate up to Canada. And there's a team of us that does an annual stock assessment. So we kind of do a, um, a population model and this provides catch advice to fisheries managers. So you know, it's a stock healthy, unhealthy. What should the uh, what recommendations are there for the um, for the uh, total allowable catch? So left hand side here is just just a map showing um, different years. Just from the survey, I just wanted to show a map. So the red is where they caught the lines are transects, so when they were going along with the boats, and it's a huge survey. It goes from California, different boats, but California up to the border with Alaska, and the red is where they uh, detected hake using acoustic uh, backscatter. So some years they migrate further north and some years they don't. But it's a big, yeah, it's a big valuable um, stock, a big component of the ecosystem. Some years they catch 300,000 tons of fish altogether and it's still uh, very healthy right now. 
the one thing that characterizes the take is that this is the estimate of uh, annual recruitment. So rec recruitment is a fisheries word. Basically think of it as new fish that are born, age zero fish born that year. And so from the model, we can estimate the uh, Bayesian model. We can estimate recruitment every year. And this is for them, the model, the assessment we did this year in January, February. And so x-axis is the years and the y-axis is recruitment. So these are medians and 95% credible intervals. So the two things stand out straight away. Some years you get very, very low recruitment. These black dots are pretty much zero. And other years you have high recruitment. So these are billions of fish. So 15 in that year, 12 or so in 1999. And also there's, so there's huge variability between years and also large uncertainty. And the uncertainty gets worse in the recent years, especially this one here, because we haven't seen the these are 2020 fish, and the data is only up to 2022. So we haven't had, had had time to observe these fish in the uh, in the survey or the fishery. So there's not much data. So it could be could be a really huge population that year, recruitment that year, or it could be quite small. We just don't know. So it'd be nice if we could get some better constraints, especially on the recent years. So um, so yeah, last year um, my colleague. Uh, mentioned that, um, so Ian Southers, he's an Australian professor from Sydney. He was working in the US and he was working on this size spectral and hake idea, which I hadn't heard about before. And it kind of funny because my size spectral work was quite independent of my hake work. So it was coming together was quite nice. And they've been working on, him and colleagues have been working on this, um, this idea. So this figure looks similar to the one I had earlier. This is actually showing a single cohort and the y-axis is, is kind of the abundance um, per size, class, by size unit, um, so abundance against size, so of a cohort. So here's the initial number of um, fish as they hatch, or larvae, and as they grow, they, there's mortality, so they decrease in size, in numbers, but they also increase in size, so you get this declining thing. And basically, you can, I, haven't, I can't remember all the details um, from these papers, but you can basically think of this as a, in a size vector context, but only looking at one species. So what we have, we have data. So we have length data that um, of these hake that are spawned in a, in a given year um, from annual surveys of, of California. So this is some of the data, this is for 2011. So we have um, data, the count, the lengths are done to the nearest millimeter. So we can think of that as being a bin. And these are the, the with the values being the midpoints. And so this is the data for 2011. And remember I said earlier, choosing X min, the power law distribution assumes a declining distribution. So the simplest way we decided was just take the, <clears throat> the mode, the highest point of the distribution, because everything else after that is declining. So doing that, we're just going to use the data in red and discard the values in blue, in black. We haven't seen um, enough of those fish. So we're going to fit the size spectra using uh, the likelihood approach to these data. And so using the binning method I mentioned earlier, and um, what we get is these: the data is the gray um, and the green blocks, and the red is the fit. So the top plot um, does not have a log axis on the y axis, and the bottom plot does. So these plots are a little bit tricky. So we again, we have body length on the x axis, so 30 up to 50 millimeters, so not a huge range. So normally size vector you think of being kind of a tenfold range in, in body mass or body size. And these, um, and the green, okay, so we have, the data of bin, thinking of this, the 30 millimeter fish is really between 29 and a half and 30 and a half millimeters. So we are, that green line there is kind of that bin. <clears throat> and if there's about 500 fish in that, and there's 100 fish in that bin, then there could be, um, for any given size in that bin, there could be between four or five, 400 and 500 fish in that bin. 
So it's a bit, a bit tricky, but basically the gray box accounts for the uncertainty in the Y values because your bin, you could have 500. So all the fish in this bin could be the lowest value of the bin or the highest value of the bin. And this kind of takes care of that uncertainty rather than a single um, point. So, so don't worry too much, it's a bit tricky, but you can see we have a nice fit of the red line is the maximum likelihood estimate, the dash are the confidence intervals. And we have a fit on, this is showing the uh, log axis. They're both logged on the x-axis, but this one is linear on the y-axis. The bottom one is logged on the y-axis. So because it's power law, <clears throat> power law, you get a fairly straight line for a bit. And then it asymptotes down here. Um, and the value here is about minus seven for the exponent, which does sound quite high, quite low, quite negative, but it is the length size spectra. And you kind of can convert it to body masses, which people are more used to thinking about. And it's about minus three if you convert it to a, a weight-based size spectra. But anyway, the point is we're just fitting, we're getting value of B, the exponent, for each year. This is one year. And then and some uncertainty in that. And um, yeah, then we can look at that in a minute. Uh, for one of the other years, for 20, uh, 2004, doing the same idea, fitting this thing, the distribution, <clears throat> you get this big value here. Um, so again, it's not a bad fit. It looks better on the top axis because the log, these log scales kind of make these differences, they exaggerate them. But you can see that the red curve is kind of being pulled out by this one fish. This is one fish here because it's a one here. So this single large fish is kind of much bigger than the others. But um, you know, can you you can't really just throw it out because it's big, because you expect to see the odd big fish. But we could just it's always good to test these things. So is that one fish having a strong influence on the estimate of B? So B is minus 10.5 if we include it. If we take it out, it's uh minus 10.2. So not having a huge influence on that on the estimate of B, which is kind of reassuring. And uh, what I've got this plot showing, so the X max value gets defined by the biggest bin we have, which is that one. Um, and the you might have noticed when you, if you played with these or looked at them, these red curves always asymptote to the, always have an asymptote. And that's basically because we're saying X max is the maximum value we can have. So no, no values can be bigger than it. <clears throat> And its y-axis is how many values are bigger than each x value. So we have to have zero values bigger than x max. And but then we take the log of that, it goes to minus infinity, which is basically why it asymptotes down to uh, minus infinity, because it, nothing can be bigger than that. So it has to asymptote there. So it's a bit technical, but if you've been wondering why these things seem to asymptote, it took me a while to figure out, figure that out. So going back to what we want to do with the, so we have this each year, we have an estimate of the B values. And these are preliminary results. I still got to check quite a few things. But what we can do is on the y-axis, plot the estimates we have of the hate recruitment each year from the stock assessment that doesn't have this length they do in it at all. It doesn't know anything about it. And I'm plotting the estimates of recruitment, but I scaled them by 2020, uh, 2010. 2010 was the uh, biggest value, this one here. It's quite a large event. Everyone knows about it. When you hear the meetings, people always talk about 2010 and 1999. So if we scale by that, it actually helps reduce some of the uncertainty. And we can, so we go from, uh, we can look at one being the 2010 recruitment. And we can see this. So, sorry, on the, that's the y-axis. The x-axis is this length, size spectrum exponent, value of B, and the, the horizontal lines are the uncertainty for those and vertical lines of uncertainty on the recruitments. And what you can see is, I mean, it's not a perfect line, clearly, but there's nothing in the top left. It's kind of saying if you have a very negative B, you never really seem to get a large recruitment event, which is quite interesting. I was quite surprised when we first got this figure. And even this one here is 2021, which is quite uncertain because it's quite recent. So this uncertainty will come down this year and I expect it to be lower. So, um, yeah, and if you have a, a higher value of B, kind of between minus six and zero, you sometimes get these big, large recruitment events, which are the ones we care about because they help sustain the fishery for, for many years. Um, but you can also get sometimes these low values. So um, we're talking today with my heat colleagues about some ways of 
maybe play around with this in the models. Um, and also, so in the assessment model, it's a Bayesian model, and we have a prior distribution for recruitment, a Bayesian prior. And the prior we use is this blue curve, here, the blue line here, the median and the big long tail to allow very big recruitments. And we use that the same every year. But you can see that clearly that's kind of, so for these, um, so every year we're saying there's a chance of it being a, a high recruitment. But some years it looks like we'd have information um, early information that it's not going to be a big year. So we're thinking about ways of adapting this or using this in our assessment or providing extra advice in the assessment to whether we think upcoming years, recent years are big or small. It takes a few years to get enough data on the cohort to really pin it down if it's really big or, or how big it is if it's big. Um, one thing that came up, I just made this to, today actually, so you might be thinking, so these fish were measured to the nearest millimeter. So is using the, is it worrying, worrying about the bins? Is that kind of overkill? Like if it's a 30 millimeter fish, worrying if it's between 29 and a half and 30 and a half millimeters seems a bit kind of overkill. But if you just, I just did this earlier, if you just use exact values and the standard likelihood approach, you do get different results. So on the left is what I just showed earlier, 2011, with the B came out as minus, about minus seven. On the right-hand side is if you just take all the values. So for 30 millimeters, if you've got 100 values in that first bin, you just do 100 values of 30, and then you do like 80 values of 31, 50 values of 32, whatever the data are. And you plot it, you end up plotting it like this. But the value of B actually comes out um, quite a bit smaller. So minus, almost minus eight, but it's about minus seven. The confidence intervals, they do overlap, but it's but the actual value is quite quite different. So it does, this was a little bit surprising actually, because it does, and it kind of agrees with the results in the second paper we had that the um that the um the MLE bin kind of is worth using. So even if it's just because to account for the resolution of, of your data. I do have some data. So in 2021, I think they started measuring to 0.01 of a millimeter, which I imagine this would be overkill, but then you would have different values. You're not gonna have repeated values of you know, 31.13 millimeters. So less of an issue, I think. <coughs> so the final part of the talk, just moving on, talking about the size vector package. So people have used our methods and um, the package in quite a few examples like um, recent years. Just to outline a couple, there's um, people looked at 160, 160 benthic communities in streams across North America. And I think they found that the, um, yeah, the exponent seemed to decline uh, with mean average temperature uh, in those streams. Uh, it's been used to look at eco as an ecosystem indicator to monitor recovery of fish communities off Newfoundland on the east coast of Canada. And um, fish communities across 235 uh, European lakes. So um, these, uh, these guys in Germany and actually published like kind of my style of figure that we developed for I think each lake or at least quite a few of them in their appendix, which is quite nice to see. And Indonesia in the, um, looking at the effect of marine protected areas in Indonesia and seeing how the size vector changed where I think it was five years of uh, no a protected zone and a less protected zone. So yeah, as I said before, the size vector package is available on GitHub. Um, and people have used it, and they've also adapted it as well. So um, Max Lindmark, who actually visited, he actually visited us this this week. He's from Sweden. Uh, he actually wrote a ggplot version of the results from the MLE bin method. I saw this in his paper and was like, oh, it looks like kind of my kind of figure, but it's a bit different. But uh, yeah, so there's other code out there, and that's part of having code freely available. People can adapt it, which is nice. Um, but one thing with the package, so it was originally written. Um, to reproduce results in the first two papers <clears throat> and to share the methods. <clears throat> and I've added some new methods, uh, features, and they're kind of discussed in the, there's a new vignette I wrote that is mentioned on the README and that, that shows some of the core steps, simplifies some of the steps we talked about earlier and has this new plotting function to give the plots I showed earlier. It's a bit simpler than the one that was originally in there. Um, and also one other, I'll cover other new features is um, 
a new type of plot for the body mass data. So we'd still fit the data, bin data using likelihood, but then plot it. If you have body mass data, you can plot it in the style of a normalized biomass plot, which is what people are used to seeing. People make these normalized, normalized biomass plots. And you can, again, work out the uncertainty <coughs> shown by these gray blocks and show the fit of the, the likelihood fit. This is for sim simulated data, so that's why it looks so nice. Um, but then I realized that you're kind of comparing a line to a block, so maybe you should really estimate how much, when you do your fit, what's the expected biomass or normalized biomass in each bin and the confidence interval of that, and you can actually plot that here. And it kind of shows that the small, the, these bins on the left are um, much more certain because there's so many organisms in them. There's much more, uncertain, much more uncertainty about the biomass in the, the bins for the larger organisms because there's much fewer organisms. Uh, one other idea we've been working on a little bit is, say you have, say you're looking at a community, but you have four different kind of different communities within that, and you've got four different sets of data. These are simulated data, so they look really nice. But you might have data for this first type of organism between these two ranges. The values are the same on the, the, the axes are the same in these four plots. And so you might have four different types of fits. You can fit each one independently. And then if you plot them on the same plot, you get these, the blue, the orange, the green and pink curves. But if you, this yellow curve is kind of make an aggregating, aggregating these four distributions together because they're overlapping. So that's kind of still in progress a bit, but it's um, an idea if you want to do a bigger ecosystem, you know, actually, you want to kind of put data together from different, um, different types of organisms, that's a way of doing it maybe. So go back to the package. It was, as I said, it was originally written to reproduce the results and many people have used it, so it's, which is good, but it's admittedly to myself, it's not as user-friendly as it could be. Uh, it contains some code that was built up kind of over many years, some even from some animal movement levy flight stuff I did uh, about 15 years ago. And that was back when you kind of wrote code for yourself but nobody was really gonna see it. You would share it, but it wasn't meant to be so kind of used widely. And <laughs> one thing I find now, I'm I write quite a few R packages in different for different applications, and you have to be kind of consistent in your style. And and this work has kind of annoying style differences in style, like bin breaks with a capital B, which is called camel case, like low and upper case, or B conf min is B B with a dot and then a capital M, which I find quite annoying now. It's a bit annoying. And the color standard is to do underscores for everything, which is what we do in our other work. So I wouldn't mind changing things to that, but I don't want to break the old code. So I'm thinking of maybe writing a slim down package, size vector two, maybe, and basically just contain the functions that people want to use, um, not try and reproduce the earlier, all the earlier figures. Some of the earlier code is tailored to the figures in the papers. So, and some of the functions are quite large and they do too many things, which is kind of bad practice. You want functions to be smaller. And then I can also include proper formatting and also code testing and coverage. If you've ever looked to the R package on GitHub, this is one we've just developing now. Uh, this green thing means it's passing. It's passing some checks that you've set up. And this code coverage tells you how many lines of code there's a test for that covers the code. And the high number here is, is very good. So <clears throat> if I started again with the package, it might be easier to do this stuff. And it'll be a simpler package, I think. So realistically, it wouldn't get to this until next year. And if you have any ideas or features, then just add them as an issue in the size spectral package we have now. I would leave the old package up for reproducibility, but um, yeah, that's kind of an idea right now. So just some comments. So size spectral applications to a range of communities. Like the method is accurate, reliable confidence intervals, and you can extend it to properly account for bin data or the resolution of measurements. And that's kind of in keeping with what Ben Bolker talked about on the start of his book, um, about adapting statistics to the data rather than vice versa. So in the past, people could do linear regressions and so they would bin the data and, and plot them on a log log plot to get a straight line. But now we can develop methods to actually account for the structure of the data. And finally, thank you to various people that helped along the way, um, past and present. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Andy.